those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And right there is the problem. By them not remembering their abuse, they often just keep perpetrating the same errors and the same abusive behavior and then conveniently forget it and do it again. What is the difference between anger and rage? Anger is in fact an emotion, an often appropriate emotion. We often express anger at situations where, we, where there's an injustice being perpetrated, where things don't feel fair, um, when somebody offends us somehow. All of those would be times we might express anger. And there are appropriate ways to express anger. We could actually say, you know, listen, I'm feeling angry because you said that. We might you know, say, I need to step away. I really need to cool down. We might even yell a little bit. Rage, however, is something different. Rage is something that's disproportionate to the situation, and it often comes up really, really quickly. Something I've commented on before is that I've said that I've never met a domestic abuser or a person who engages in any kind of domestic violence who was not a narcissist. And I hold to my guns on that one. Not only is it a lack of empathy and all the other stuff that goes with being a domestic abuser, but also there is this rapid rage. And anyone who's ever been in a situation will say, yep, it was the rage. It wasn't anger. It was something that was almost a menace and it would happen so, so quickly. You'd almost notice something in their face just as they were about to turn and it would almost be monstrous. Rage can be incredibly terrifying. And in fact, many clients I've worked with who had narcissistic parents will say that the rage was one of the most terrifying elements of their childhood. People I work with who have narcissistic parent, uh, people I work with who have narcissistic partners will also say it's the rage that is so terrifying that it will happen so quickly. And I have to say that the common theme that has come up over and over again is sort of that change in a person's face. They're going about their business. Something happens. They click over. Their face changes. You can almost see the impending doom and before you can get out of there, the rage will express itself. It'll often, it can be any way, it can often be yelling, but it's not unusual for it to be toppled over furniture, objects being thrown, and then obviously in the most dangerous cases, violence. That can be violence through fists, with weapons, with objects, but it is, it's again, it is very, very terrifying. Rage is such an excessive expression of emotion that it tells us a lot that this person is deeply dysregulated. And dysregulation, or the inability to regulate or control emotions, is a hallmark of narcissism. People who have narcissistic personality styles cannot control their emotions. Whether they're even positive emotions like joy, they'll be overly happy, and kind of let it overtake the room. The same with negative emotions. It's almost as though if this was the normal range of expressing, expressing an emotion, they would take it all the way out to here. So it's that extreme and that inability to regulate the emotion that's really, really the challenge. And obviously rage is, is a very scary emotion. So it's the one that many of us notice. When it comes to rage, you can notice it in lots of places. This is the person who, when they're driving a car and somebody maybe cuts them off or honks at them, they will then proceed to chase that person, ride their bumper, keep screaming at them, maybe even stop their car and get out of their car to start screaming at them. That's what rage is. It is something, it's, it's very, it's a very diseased sort of a state. It kind of takes a person over and turns them into something very, very ugly. It's the kind of thing where a person doesn't like something somebody says to them over Thanksgiving dinner and they get up and their face is bright red and they're like banging their fists on the table and they don't even stop to think what this excessive expression of emotion is doing to the other people that are around them. It's as though a person who's experiencing rage becomes blind to anything else. Rage is at its core terrifying and frankly, it's unacceptable. If a person is feeling that much overwhelming anger, probably the best thing to do is really step out of the situation, say, I need a moment to gather myself, but if they had it that well put together, they wouldn't be dysregulated in the first place. People who are narcissistic are very, very hypersensitive. Something we'll be talking about during the 30 days of narcissism. That hypersensitivity often means that they overinterpret even the slightest, slightest kind of an insult. And that overinterpretation 
can result in these massive shows of rage. They can't tolerate the idea that somebody might possibly be criticizing them or making fun of them. It's a pattern we do quite often see in all forms of narcissism, particularly, for example, in covert narcissism. You'll see people with covert narcissism who just carry this quiet, brooding anger with them for years. And sometimes they're the ones who will often snap to tragic consequence. So rage is something that's dangerous for the world at large. It often makes our freeways and highways more dangerous. It can make public places more dangerous. It can make our intimate relationships more dangerous and family relationships more dangerous. It's about, it's about that sense, that anger that goes off like a wildfire. Nobody, nobody should ever have to be caught in the face of rage and feel like they're stuck in it. And yet it happens to us all the time. Rage is definitely a sign of the dysregulation that we watch and observe regularly in narcissism. And when you see it coming once, even once to see an expression of rage should be a major red flag to you that something's not quite right. So let's take on this term, passive aggressive. It's a term lots of people throw around, not just in the world of narcissism. So this term came up in so many other episodes in this series that I recognize that understanding the passive aggressive dynamic and what this term really means actually becomes critical to understanding some of the most toxic patterns and toxic dynamics which underlie narcissistic relationships. Now it's not a pattern just restricted to narcissism but it definitely comes up a lot. Now passive aggression as it were is a psychologically immature and indirect way of attempting to get needs met and of issuing criticism or insults. The passive reflects the indirect nature of the communication. You're not going directly in and asking. And the aggressive to the fact that whatever is being said is still somewhat injurious, it still hurts, and can induce a negative mood state most often what people experience is guilt. Now, unlike the grandiose narcissist who will just insult you right to your face, passive aggressive people will often cast themselves in sort of a victim or martyr role that can result in uncomfortable feelings by you rather than almost that fear you'd get if someone was right up in your face. And most often, like I said, that feeling is guilt by the person who's hearing it. So they might say something like, oh, glad you had fun on your business trip. Must be nice to go to sunny Miami while the rest of us were back here freezing. Uh, life here is the usual misery, but, but I am so glad that you had fun. Or they might say something like, you know, we're trying to be really happy for your success. And you know, it, it, we really are, we're really happy for you. Now, uh, your father hasn't worked for years and we know we can't help you to help us, expect you to help us. And then they may even say something like, ah, you know, I've been up all night. So yeah, but I'm happy to do that for you. No, I, but I've been up all night. Now the phrase must be nice is often the tagline for passive aggression. It must be nice that you have so much money. It must be nice that you went on vacation to Hawaii. It must be nice that things are working out for you. That phraseology must be nice ends up being sort of quite confusing. Yes, it was nice, but it was nice for me and I can see it was not nice for you. And I guess I'm supposed to feel a little bad about that. This pattern can actually cause you to question your own reality. You don't know how quite to respond and it doesn't allow for direct communication to take place. Passive aggressive people or this style, people who have this style will often portray themselves as being long suffering while they point out your shortcomings or share sort of their perception that somehow you or life in general has let them down instead of coming out directly and stating their discomfort with a particular situation. Now in that way, there, I have to be honest with you, I think in passive aggression, there's a fair bit of entitlement and grandiosity built into these kinds of passive aggressive patterns. 
I am entitled to something different or maybe what you have or I'm entitled to get something from you because I'm me and after all I stayed up all night and you didn't give it to me so I should get it. Passive aggressive patterns typically co-occur with other kinds of patterns, things like being sort of petulant and tantrumy, sullen and resentful and a sort of a tendency at times to demonstrate tamper tantrums where there's a lot of woe is me oh my god my life's so hard i only did sleep for four hours but yeah i guess i'll drive you or i did only sleep for four hours i mean the whole sleep thing you can see that's a big issue for me because so many people have brought it up to me passive aggression is the signature move of the covert narcissist and that actually makes sense they are of course the most victimized narcissist and more about that will come up next month when we do a series about the seven types of narcissism you might meet while you walk down the street but you have to stay tuned for that but that victim orientation means that passive aggressiveness becomes the key pathway to manipulating other people it's actually a rather efficient tool for drawing out an emotion such as guilt in somebody who's vulnerable to it and reinforcing the existing victimhood of the passive aggressive person. Oh, my life is so much harder than everybody else's. The fact is though that passive aggressive patterns are a standard part of all types of narcissism because all narcissists are vulnerable to feeling like victims, even the grandiose ones, even the malignant ones. They will pull passive aggressiveness out as a tool of relating, or it comes out pretty regularly when we look at narcissistic personality. And like I said, it's not necessarily just restricted to narcissism. I'm sure you've seen it in other kinds of st personality styles. Now, in a close relationship, passive aggression feels absolutely awful, and it's kind of designed to feel awful. If you are already a person that struggles with guilt or similar negative emotions, the fact is, though, that passive aggressive patterns are a standard part of all types of narcissism because all narcissists are vulnerable to feeling like victims. It doesn't matter if they're grandiose narcissists, um, uh, malignant narcissists, all of them. They will pull passive aggressiveness out or it comes out pretty regularly in all forms of narcissism. Now, in a close relationship, passive aggression feels absolutely awful. And the fact is, that's what it's designed to be. Now, if you are a person who already does struggle with feeling guilty or just general feelings of guilt or other similar negative emotions, it's a manipulative trick that will work like a charm with you. It can often be a way, passive aggression can often be a way to get your buy-in on a variety of things without you even knowing it. And because the feeling of guilt is so uncomfortable, most people want to avoid that uncomfortable feeling. So you might capitulate or give in to the passive aggressive manipulation, often to avoid the uncomfortable feelings that it evokes. So for example, you go ahead because you don't want to listen to the passive aggressive stuff. You do things like, I don't know, you empty the dishwasher. You do the extra task that needs to be done around the house. You put the kids to bed, even though it can take a long time because you just don't want to hear about how hard they work or how difficult their life is. It's just easier to do the task. And I get it. Sadly, in doing this, the narcissist gets enabled to keep using their passive aggressive tricks. But in each individual story, all of you are experiencing, you might say, I'm just giving in because I want to survive. That's it. And if you try to push back, I did, I worked hard too. say something like that. 
the argument will be so toxic that you need to weigh out whether it's just not easier to give in and do it, empty the darn dishwasher, than actually get into the argument. It's a lot easier to deal with a dishwasher. Now, passive aggression is a classical dynamic in narcissistic family systems. These are the systems in which guilt is merely a standard entree at every meal. The classical narcissistic parent trope is, I do so much for you, and, and now you fill in the blank of however your parents use their passive aggressive skills. It's amazing to me how many narcissistic parents actually expect some kind of payout on parenting as though you somehow owe them something for them doing what was exactly expected of a person who made the decision to become a parent. You almost wonder if one day they're not going to just roll up and hand you a bill. Passive aggressive rants in these kinds of families about what they gave up how hard their lives have been, the opportunities you have that they don't have. Those set the scene. And then they follow it up with something that they need you to do and that you didn't deliver on. In many cases, in these family systems, it sort of results in people jumping through hoops to attempt to satisfy the insatiable narcissist who just keeps employing the passive aggressive dynamic as a backdoor and cruel way of getting needs met while leaving guilt in their wake. I gave up so much for you. You can't show up for the holiday. I did so much. You can't fly for your cousin's wedding. And not surprisingly, it plays out quite often in the workplace with narcissistic coworkers and managers using the passive aggressive techniques to push work off on other people, work that they don't want to do and they, they want other people to do it for them, and employing manipulation and guilt to get what they need done, done without breaking as much of a sweat themselves. They'll often do this by falling back on their victimhood and their tales of woe and I was up all night and I have to drive so much farther than you. These passive aggressive folks are often the ones who actually outlast everyone else in the workplace who may actually actually get so burned out and sick of it that they seek out other jobs rather than stay in a workplace that may be characterized by an inequitable workload that results from everybody giving in to the passive aggressive demands of this person. And by then, it's often too late to straighten out the dynamic. And any, any poor sucker who takes a job and has to work with this passive aggressive person, good luck with that. I guess everyone's just waiting for them to retire. So listen, here's the thing. We're all a little bit guilty of a little passive aggressive from time to time. I don't know, when you go up to that friend, nah, I don't, I don't mind that you didn't invite me to your party. I was actually looking forward to binging TV and ordering in. I'm usually alone on the weekends anyhow, so why should this weekend be any different? But you know what? It's, it's such a drag because, you know, I, I got these tickets for this amazing concert. It's about six months from now. And, you know, I, I, you're not going to want to go, so I'm not going to, no need. So it's kind of sad, but fess up. We all do it, but we cannot get into a habit of doing this. And we do need to catch ourselves. It's when it's a pattern, it's an issue. But passive aggression is a universal part of the narcissistic relationship because manipulation is a universal part of the narcissistic relationship. We can avoid doing it by just coming clean. If something bothers us, we need to get over our fear of conflict and disappointment and just say it directly and not play games. This kind of game playing is often what can devolve into passive aggressiveness. Now, in the face of passive aggression, if someone's being that way towards us, we may feel guilty, uncomfortable, 
frustrated, might even pity them, feel bad for them, and they're staying up all night, or defensive or angry. Passive aggression often feels more victimized than many of the other dynamics and patterns of toxic people and of narcissists. Now, so that kind of begs the question, why? Why do narcissists so often behave in a passive aggressive manner, especially since they're often emboldened to kind of attack you in your face? But as always, for so many of the questions of why around narcissism, it's the insecurity. It's a way of protecting themselves in the face of a slight or an insult or a disappointment. It also works as a tool to keep people in line and it also works as a manipulation. You get a lot of bang from the passive aggressive buck if you're narcissistic. Because communication is not exactly a narcissistic person's strong suit, getting their needs met through other means, such as passive aggressive comments, it often works. And let's face it, narcissist or no narcissist, if something works for us, we tend to repeat it. But this pattern also goes back to the issue of emotional regulation because narcissistic people cannot regulate their emotions, nor can they regulate their sense of self-esteem. Either they're going to attack someone when they feel disappointed, or they paint themselves as a victim in order to make sense of what's happening and in order to get the support and the validation of other people. Now this term, passive aggressive, is used so often when discussing narcissism and yet so many people are unclear about it. The one thing we do know for sure is that it doesn't feel good when it's happening to you. Honestly, it doesn't even feel very good when you're doing it. And it can often be a centerpiece of these relationships. In fact, it can feel so uncomfortable that many people may feel that they just wish a person would come out with it, even if it's an insult, and just say it to their face straight and out loud, rather than to persistently keep behaving in a passive aggressive manner. Passive aggression, in many ways, is sort of an intergenerational pattern. We often sort of might even laugh it off as, ah, her mom just, that's what they do. Moms, they, they cause this guilt. And people say, that's how it is in our culture. Moms create guilt. Maybe so. But the, the struggle is, is that it really can rob you of the ability to learn how to communicate directly, especially if you take on that style of communicating yourself as an adult. But it definitely is something that leaves people, it, it sort of robs the authenticity of a relationship, right? Because now you can't speak directly to someone. You're kind of always figuring out the workarounds. And particularly in narcissistic relationships where you're constantly trying to avoid all the little things that might explode, just trying to avoid this kind of uncomfortable, unpleasant, passive aggressive pattern means you put a lot of energy into trying to avoid these backhanded insults and, I don't know, kind of very manipulative ways to get your buy-in or agreement to do something that you may not necessarily want to do. And when you do slip in your own life and do it, catch yourself and try not to do it again. So I hope this video has clarified what is meant by passive aggression, especially in the context of a narcissistic relationship. Given the victimhood that we see in this pattern, it's a very common place for them to fall back on. And when it happens to you, you'll know it. It feels uncomfortable. It has a name. And also, oftentimes, your best way to approach it is to communicate back directly and clearly. I'm not saying they're going to learn it, but two wrongs don't make a right. What is narcissistic amnesia? So this term, narcissistic amnesia, there's variations on this particular term arose when I was reading different pieces of research and theoretical work about narcissism and narcissistic abuse. Other sources have termed this abuse amnesia, but I really do think this sort of kind of amnesia we observe in narcissism 
takes in more territory than just forgetting about how they've abused you in the past. Amnesia refers to memory loss of any kind. In the case of narcissistic amnesia, it comes down to how they conveniently forget things they have said and that they've done, but they are very selective about what they forget. They conveniently forget about the bad stuff that they've done. Now, ironically, the flip side of narcissistic amnesia is narcissistic grandiosely extraordinary memory because they have an uncanny ability to remember the few good things that they have done for you with the precision of a supercomputer. But let's take on the abuse amnesia or the narcissistic amnesia piece of this. What does this look like? Because as soon as I start giving you these examples, you're going to know exactly what I mean. They forget the really icky things that they're responsible for. And these are the kinds of things that might happen in a close, intimate relationship. Things like the one night stand they had when you guys were engaged, but you still married them. Or the weird, micro-cheating, emotional affair they had with a coworker that was actually quite scandalous. Or the time they got drunk at your work event and behaved badly in front of your boss, which actually kind of hurt you in your job. Now, this kind of abuse amnesia, this narcissistic amnesia, can also happen with parents. If it's your parent, it could be the time they forgot to come to an important event for you. Or they chose to go to their own party on a night when you were very sick and a little bit scared or humiliating you in front of a new wife or your new boyfriend or your new husband or your new girlfriend or lying to you about an important family matter. They forget, narcissists in general, forget the things that make them look bad. They forget the things they did that raise the possibility that perhaps they're just not a very nice person. And because narcissistic individuals are so insecure they do not allow themselves to integrate anything into their inner world that chips away of that precious portrait of them as anything but that grandiose and charitable superman or superwoman they really wish that they were and are delusional enough to believe that at some level they are. And in that way, narcissistic amnesia is very protective for them. If they conveniently forget it, then they do not have to struggle with the parts of themselves that make them uncomfortable, the parts of themselves that do bad things. Now listen, we all screw up, but we also, and we uncomfortably, remember those screw-ups, and we own up to them, and we cringe when we remember them, and ideally, we don't do them again. Narcissistic amnesia is a form of gaslighting. Their unwillingness or their inability to recall their bad behavior really does undercut your reality. Now, the million-dollar question, of course, does the narcissist really not remember that bad thing they do? Now, since no one's ever really systematically done the research on this, it's actually hard to know. All we know is that they will often deny the bad things they do claim to not recall the bad things they do, and when they're shown evidence of these bad things, if evidence even exists, they might cop to it, but in that hazy way that someone in a soap opera who's lost their memory would do, like, oh yes, now I remember, it was so long ago, and I just forgot about it, it's not that important, it was so long ago. To hear that feels absolutely awful, because that memory of that very real transgression of that bad behavior was often very devastating for you. And it may have even been a turning point in the relationship or even in your life for you. A massive red flag, a point when you considered pulling the plug, ending the relationship, going no contact, or may have felt so depressed or anxious you just didn't know what to do. Their rather convenient amnesia in some ways is an invalidation of your experience and it can leave you feeling as though the two of you weren't even in the same relationship. Honestly, in some ways you weren't. Because narcissistic amnesia can really impact you in the same way as gaslighting, it is obviously very destabilizing.
The other challenge that's raised by narcissistic amnesia is when you attempt to talk about these forgotten events for them, when you try to bring them back up, you may be written off as petty, as somebody who keeps dwelling in the past, as somebody who's unable to ever let go. They use their convenient memory loss to paint you in an unflattering and invalidating manner. It can make raising these issues even more difficult, and you may find yourself ruminating, questioning, and obsessing over these past episodes. And since the narcissist claims to have forgotten these past episodes, you are left holding the bag and wondering if it even ever happened. You start to look like one of those people in those UFO movies, the only one who saw the UFO, but the government claims there's no record and no picture. You know how that goes? You're the only one who saw it, right? Those, those poor people in those movies end up sort of losing their minds. Now, narcissistic amnesia is also very problematic because since the narcissists forget their past actions, forget their past actions, their amnesia then means that they cannot learn from these behaviors and change their patterns. When the rest of us do something bad, as much as we may not want to, we do remember, and then hopefully we try not to do these things again. But if you have forgotten you did something and then you have no memory of it, it's not going to result in change. And as such, narcissistic individuals keep making the mistake. And it's, they, they look at it, it's like, it's like the first time they ever did it. And before long, you are living in Groundhog Day. They keep, mistake, they keep making mistakes and doing bad things. They keep forgetting them. And they keep repeating them. Now, what is really galling? is that this narcissistic amnesia is definitely selective amnesia. Like I said, they remember the few times that they did something good. You know, that time they drove you to the airport, or that time they did wait in the emergency room with you, or that they took your parents on a vacation. They remember those things forever and ever, and they parade out those memories of the good things they did forever and ever. They wear it like a big, superficial and grandiose show of what a great person they are. And they need to do that. Remember, that insecurity they have is why they are always validation seeking and preening and polishing their trophies and needing people to tell them they're great and prop up their fragile egos. That's why they remember their good stuff. Their minds are tro like a trophy case for the few good things they did. God forbid they had to store all the bad ones. Now, in real amnesia, people would forget just about everything. Some people who have amnesia forget very old stuff from earlier in their life. Some people with amnesia forget recent memory. But they do not engage in cherry picking. Amnesia is amnesia. You clear out the, the internal hard drive. Now, narcissistic amnesia, just like gaslighting, can not only leave you feeling like you are the one who is losing your own memory, but it can also play on a sense of guilt, which is a common dynamic in these relationships. You can feel like a bit of a negative Nelly, kind of holding on to these painful stories and memories that the narcissist sort of blithely forgets, but that those were watershed important moments for you. And then you just get tired of only talking about all those good times when they were so peppered by so many really abusive ones. Now, over time, the narcissist's amnesia not only leaves you confused and upside down as well as doubting yourself, but it also leaves you feeling isolated because entire swaths of your relationship are missing. You remember them. The narcissist does not. This process happens gradually. The first few times they say they don't remember something, you may make excuses for them. Maybe he really didn't remember it. Uh, maybe I am remembering it wrong. Or no one remembers everything they do or say. And then over time, you feel as though you have stepped into the twilight zone. Now, I recognize that some of you watching this may have witnessed family members or other loved ones who have experienced dementia 
or the memory loss that is often either due to aging, as well as specific dementias like Alzheimer's disease or, or associated with any number of disease processes. And if you have also witnessed narcissistic amnesia, then you know the difference between the two. In true dementia, where amnesia is a central part of it, the brain's memory systems are failing or have become damaged due to a stroke or other deteriorate, deteriorative process that's due to aging or an illness, head injury, or dementing processes like I spoke about, like Alzheimer's disease or even things like are called a frontotemporal dementia, in which specific brain areas and functions are lost. People with dementia may also lose memory for prior events from a long time ago or recent events, things that they just did today, or have other kinds of changes such as behavioral changes or even personality changes. But in dementia and the amnesia associated with dementia, it tends to be all-encompassing. And while their memory may come in and out, it may be better in the morning, it may be worse in the evening, this, this pattern of amnesia associated with dementia overtakes a life. It makes getting through the days for them much, much more difficult and at times even dangerous. And it can be very, very painful to witness because you can see the struggle on your dear one's face, on this person who's close to you and watching them have this. Now trust me, this is not what narcissistic amnesia looks like. And narcissistic amnesia is a process in which the person looks just fine most of the time. And then when it is convenient for them, they forget the abuse. They forget the abuse they put on you. They forgot how badly they treated you. They forget what would make them look bad. While you would feel tremendous compassion for a person living with dementia or other forms of organic memory loss, you do not feel compassion for the person who is manifesting narcissistic amnesia. Instead, what you may be feeling is anger, confusion, or anxiety, and none of these are good feelings, and they're certainly not compassion. The abuse amnesia of a narcissist can be galling when it is your parent, and this plays out most horrifically when the amnesia is for bigger ticket abuse, such as physical or sexual abuse. I suppose it could be argued whether it is their pseudo-amnesia or whether it's denial. Either way, whether they don't remember critical events that harmed you or they, they sort of kind of forget the many cruel and invalidating things they said or did during your childhood. Not only did it shape a confusing and painful childhood riddled with invalidation and self-doubt, but this becomes a legacy you take into adulthood. Your parent may very well still claim to not remember any of the abusive events that may have happened in your childhood, which further invalidates your experience and frankly really does a number on your mental health as you try to piece together your own history in the name of simply just wanting to have some self-understanding and the person, the other person, your parent, who holds the other puzzle pieces isn't willing, open, willing to open up about them. I actually do believe that narcissistic, in a narcissistic am, um, amnesia that a parent would engage in over the course of a lifetime is the most destabilizing form of narcissistic amnesia because it shapes who you are and it steals important pieces of your history that if those weren't stolen, it would have made it a lot easier for you to move forward and let go. Abuse amnesia is something we witness in all forms of narcissistic relationships and narcissistic abuse, even in the workplace. A narcissistic boss or a toxic colleague may forget a past difficult experience and that difficult experience might be because they were horribly disorganized or lost important files or just engaged in other bad behavior, which sets you up to repeat that cycle again and again in the workplace. And it is the repeated cycles that is the problem. Santayana said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And right there is the problem. By them not remembering their abuse, 
they often just keep perpetrating the same errors and the same abusive behavior and then conveniently forget it and do it again. Narcissistic amnesia or again, or abuse amnesia, call it what you will, are key pillars of how narcissistic abuse is inflicted on another person. It feels like a combination of gaslighting and denial and can be as confusing and angering as both of those, if not more so. In the face of it, as is the case in all narcissistic relationships, in order to survive, you need to hold tight onto your reality and memories. And the narcissist's forgetting anything cannot be an eraser to your own experiences. Their abuse amnesia may work out real well for them, but it is not good for you. And for any of you who have had this experience of the narcissist in your life, just sort of forgetting, just forgetting, and then when you do finally put it in front of them or have evidence of it, and then they kind of hit you with, gosh, you are a petty person just always bringing up the past, you know how this cycle plays out. It's a real thing. It's a real part of narcissistic abuse, and it is the kind of thing as part of your healing to at least understand this phenomenon so that when it happens to you, no, it's not your brain that's not working well. It's the difficult situation you find yourself in. So if you have ever been on the receiving end of a smear campaign, first of all, I do not envy you. It's absolutely awful. But if you've ever been on the receiving end of a smear campaign initiated by a narcissistic person, you know that it may be one of the most confusing, destabilizing, heartbreaking, and am I losing my mind experiences you can have. So let's then think about what the core of gaslighting is. Gaslighting is not just a dismantling of reality. That's one essential piece. But there's also that piece of attempting to paint you and convincing you that there's something wrong with you. Gaslighting is a consistent sort of process. So it's repeated so often that if we don't know what's happening, we may actually start believing that we're impaired, we've lost, we've lost touch with the reality, and that we are seeing and recalling and experiencing things the wrong way. Another reason gaslighting works is because it's perpetrated by someone that you have trust in for some reason. They may be a family member, a person you're in a committed relationship with, a close friend, or even someone who's an expert in their field. So you trust them, making their word have more weight and more value. Now, imagine that five people, 10 people are doing the same thing. Multiple people you know and trust, maybe even love, a group of family members, a group of friends, a set of colleagues, all buying into something that not only is in defiance of reality, but also paints you as bad or dishonest or incompetent or cruel or manipulative or even as narcissistic. I don't think we sufficiently recognize how harmful smear campaigns can be, not just to reputation, but to how they hurt us psychologically. It's bad enough going through narcissistic abuse with one person, but then when the people around you don't see it and aren't willing to recognize it, they may actually buy what the narcissistic gaslighter is saying as plausible. And then they, that group of people, may go all in and be willing to believe the distortions and this presentation and narrative of you as impaired. It's one thing that the narcissistic person is doing a bad thing. We sort of expect it. After enough time, even when we're feeling upside down, we have been invalidated and criticized, criticized and just treated badly enough for long enough that we aren't surprised that they are not nice to us. It doesn't feel good. But radical acceptance, if you've been working at this, radical acceptance often does kick in. At least we can see it clearly. But the devastation is when people we actually thought were our support systems, who had our backs, our families, our friends, our colleagues, people we may have even turned to in the past for help with this difficult relationship, when that group can be co-opted and can be infected. Listen, the narcissistic person manipulated and tricked and charmed you for a long time. Why don't, they, why don't we think that they can get to everyone else too? 
They can and they do. Smear campaigns can happen quickly. And for example, when a relationship ends, the narcissistic person mobilizes pretty quickly and they may get to the other people who are close to you and sell their version of events and convince people of their narrative. And then and more often than not, a lot of other people will go with it. This can also happen slowly over time. And even years later, you may hear something from someone that shows you that even again, years later, that the narcissistic person is not giving it a rest and is continuing to paint a twisted and unkind picture of you and any events that unfolded between the two of you. But ultimately, all smear campaigns are gaslighting campaigns. Campaigns. It's a group of people denying reality and painting you as impaired. Maybe someone might come up to your old friend might say, oh, maybe you were too demanding in the relationship and that's why it didn't work out. Maybe you were too anxious. Or they might say, oh, they made it sound like you were doing some shady stuff. Uh, you always did have a temper. When gaslighting is a group event, it is a thousand times more potent. But one person doing a smear campaign is able to distort many people's reality and most pointedly yours. I know that when I have experienced this, I scratch my head and question myself and saying, multiple people are saying this, could this be true? But the only antidote I have in my life are the people who are my anti-gaslighters and the counterweight against the BS. I hope all of you have at least one person in your life who can be that for you. Doesn't make the smear campaign hurt less, but at least you don't feel like you've completely lost it. Smear campaigns can completely complicate the processing of grief and other feelings after a narcissistic relationship. It feels as though you're mounting multiple losses. You're just losing multiple people. But for any of you who have been through a smear campaign, at least maybe thinking about framing it as gaslighting can be a wake up call on why the smear campaign is not only so destabilizing, but why you, you feel your heart has broken in so many ways. This is utter devastation. Smear campaigns, many people will say, you know what, after a while I figured out the narcissistic abuse. But the idea that people I even went to about this relationship ended up falling in line with what the narcissistic person was saying or implying about me or twisting facts or whatever, it was a, that they said that was the real devastation because they were supposed to be my soft place to land. So make no mistake, smear campaigns really are just large scale gaslighting and gaslighting, no gaslighting, whatever. We do know that smear campaigns, smear campaigns are something that can really impair a person's ability to heal and move forward from these relationships.